Welcome to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Many of us struggle with sales. This could be due to a lack in confidence, comfort, or just not wanting to be salesy. We want to help our customers. We know we can. We complicate the process. This podcast is designed to help folks like you improve at sales and problem solving through process, practice, frameworks, and thinking. I'm Mike Simmons. This episode is brought to you by the Catalyst Sale Game Plan, an approach to goal setting and execution. You can head to catalystsale.com forward slash game plan for more information. Today, Dewan Brown joins me. Dewan is a friend. He's got 20 years of experience in the sales game. He is the Senior Director of Global Sales at Seismic and volunteer with Sales for the Culture. Dewan Brown, it is good to see you. Now everybody else is going to hear you because we don't do video on the <laughs> podcast, but it's, yeah. good, it's good to see you, man. How are you doing? I'm doing good. It's good to see you always. Always good to chat with you, man. This is... Good. This is a long time coming. This is a long time right. coming. You're doing some pretty cool things. And one of the cool things you're working on, actually, what, you know, give people a little bit of background. Who are you? Yeah, yeah. I'm Dewan Brown. In terms of the work I do on a day to day basis, I'm a, you know, senior director of global sales at Seismic, sales marketing enablement, really revenue enablement solution, and a bunch of stuff outside of Seismic on the side and in an effort to serve our community. How do you serve the community? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's and it's it's interesting because it's it's really at times in my life it's been really tough to find like a balance between like serving the community and doing it in a field that I care a lot about and I'm passionate about. So one of the big ways that I'm seeking to serve the community now is through an organization called Sales for the Culture, which <laughs> interestingly enough, it started like Morgan Ingram, who probably everyone who's listening to this or a lot of people who are listening to this will know Morgan Ingram. He a while back, like over a year. It may have been a year and a half ago, decided that there was a space needed for Black sellers in tech to just have a place to see other faces that look like their own and have conversations and learn and teach and learn amongst one another. And so it turned into a Slack group. And I hightailed it over to that Slack group immediately because I felt the need internally myself. And over time, it sort of morphed and grown. And so it ended up becoming, under the leadership of Marcus Knight, KD, you know, Nikki Ivey, Morgan himself, of course, Jacob Gerwald, and a host of others, Larry Long, and, and a host of others, Roderick Jefferson, I could keep naming. It's actually a thing, right? Like where February 1 official launch was for Sales for the Culture. And the, the, the goal is to have a place where sellers can be attracted to the tech industry, specifically Black sellers, empowered within that community, enabled, you know, sharpened and included really in the black tech sales profession as a whole. So there are you know, different groups within it, sub-communities. I happen to lead up the sales leader sub-community. There's also an AE sub-community, an SDR sub-community, and a sub-community for those who are not yet in sales, but are interested in sales and want to learn more from people who are actually doing the work. And so it's, it's, a, it's a huge deal. It's supported by a nonprofit out of Chicago, headed up by a gentleman named Shelton Banks, who's also instrumental in this. And that support has been, been invaluable as well. So it's, it's, it's a phenomenal thing. It is. It's good to hear familiar names. And some of those familiar names I've known, for, known in different capacities for a little bit of time. And some yeah. of them I've just recently met. So yeah. this, isn't, it, isn't it pretty cool how powerful a community can be? get as it comes together and starts to build momentum and it starts to amplify voices. Isn't that a pretty cool thing to see? It's been amazing to see. It's always cool to see that in a community generally. But in, in this case, like some of the minds that are that are assembled within this community, and some of them are under the radar, right? Like, you know, I had a conversation last night with three leaders specifically, Terry Arbaugh, you know, Bershu. I need to get Bershu's last name. I don't want to mess his last name up, but this guy's a powerhouse. And then also, you know, I had in that same meeting, it was myself, it was Bershu, and it was Simon Teckle. And we were, we were talking about managing up and some other things that were just the minds that are in this group. And then you think about the ones that you already know. Many of you may not even know Terry Arba. I shouted him out on, on uh, I See You Friday on LinkedIn the other day. Many of you may not know Bershu, and again, I'll get his last name in just a moment, and many of you may not know Simon Teckle, but the, the wealth of knowledge, experience, and insight that, that rests in their minds amongst the hundreds of others within this community, really, really encouraging and exciting. 
I think one of the things that drives me a little bit nuts, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to go off on a crazy rant. And this is probably one of those things where we'll just say, Hey, take this thing out. Or there's going to be other people who'll be like, Hey, you should have taken this out. But what, right. there are, there are some powerful voices out there mm-hmm. who have an ability to impact success and change. They get lost in the broader noise because mm-hmm. some of the, some of the other voices that are out there are just right. so loud yeah. that they push this information out there. And because they're loud and that's what they do is they just they're really good at marketing the pieces of information. They can actually do a lot to stifle growth and development yeah. and activity in the marketplace. And it is, it's cool to see communities come together, whether it's through a Slack channel, uh, then that evolves into something like a clubhouse group and, mm-hmm. and a number of the different ways that information can get out there. It's cool to see those groups come together who are really focused on making a positive impact in areas where we can give back in yeah. and see those things move forward. And they're not the known, they're not the known names. At least they're not known to me. I mean, the number of the ones are, but that we've talked yeah. through. And we all know who these people are. I mean, there, right. there are a lot of people whose voices are starting to get a little bit bigger out there too, because of yeah. the they're having. So that is one reason I'm excited about what can happen with the positive light in community is some yeah. would get lost now get a chance to thrive and get a chance to shine. But yeah. how do we, so how do we overcome the challenge of signal and noise? How do we help amplify people's signals mm-hmm. through the noise, given the amount of noise that's out there, especially in the sales and marketing and revenue ops and all yeah. this stuff, all this space, any thoughts there? Yeah. You know, it's, that's a good observation that it, that it is a lot of noise and signal and it's, it's not easy. But I think that those of us who have any type of audience and have any type of integ- you know, interaction or engagement with the people that, that we're talking about, right? Those who are not making a lot of noise on their own and for themselves and on behalf of themselves. Like, I think we all can make a better effort of bringing attention where attention is, is warranted, right? Again, the prime example was this Friday when I did I See You Fridays. I do that biweekly. And that is the purpose. It's like, hey, th- this is somebody worth learning from, right? At, you know, in whatever the, the field or whatever the, the segment of sales or whatever it is, this is somebody worth learning from. I have been greatly impacted by this person. You don't know this person more than likely you should. And so using the platform that I have, which is not a huge or major platform, but using whatever platform and whatever opportunities I have, particularly to magnify that voice and bring some attention to it, that these people who are, you know, typically very humble and below the radar because of that humility, they would never do that for themselves or or in their own steed or stead. So I, I feel like it's an obligation to do that. And I think more of us need to be looking for those voices where we are learning. I mean, because, you know, you know, attribution is one thing, but there's, there are techniques, there are things, there are strategies that are, there are thought, there are processes that we pick up from various places. And I think a lot of times, like those don't get properly, properly attributed or we take them in passing and continue to execute against them and see great results. But I think when that happens, we may be afforded a good opportunity to, to pause and reflect on where these nuggets came from and bring some light to the source, right? And so that's, that's one way I think that we, we can all do it. Yeah. And, if you, and if, I think if you are hearing kind of the same thing over and over again from multiple people, it might be an indicator that that works, or it might be an indicator that that you know that that's just the thing that gets people right. excited and that's what people want to respond to because they're preying on you know on a your own internal feeling about getting something done i if i was talking with Dwan before he joined on i'm like man i am out of shape so <laughs> throw me someone who will talk about ways to get in shape and i will like a like a mosquito to the blue light i, <laughs> yeah. I, start, finding, I start finding my way over there but it's i think what it, what comes down is we we know what our insecurities are. We know where we're vulnerable. We think mm-hmm. that there's an opportunity that somebody else has figured some things out. And, and what you realize is if you take the time to engage with people who are doing the work, who are putting themselves out there in some of these areas, you'd be surprised at how quickly they respond. I, I mean, I sent a note. I, Larry and I were on a, um, and I, you know, now we're on first name basis, but Larry Long yeah. and I were on a clubhouse <laughs> and he had mentioned something, sent him a LinkedIn message and he said, are you available now? And we spoke for just a couple of minutes on Saturday afternoon. Like, yeah. and, and he's everywhere, right? You realize how everywhere someone like Larry is. Yeah. These folks are accessible. They want to help. That's right. In, That's right. In, and we all learn together. This is, 
okay, one of the things that Dewan has been sharing for a while now is this whole idea of learn, teach, learn, learn, teach, yeah. learn, and that cycle yeah. of learn, teach, learn. So you want to talk a little bit about that and then we'll get into how this kind of applies to some buyer experience stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Learn, teach, learn is like the essence of, you know, what I'm about, right? That's, that's my MO. Like I, I really am a lifelong learner, a student, and I believe that the best way to retain it, first of all, it just pragmatically, the best way to retain something that you've learned is to teach it to someone else, right? The best way to assess how well you've learned it is your ability to teach it to someone else, right? And then that cycle continues. Like I never stop learning and therefore I never stop teaching because I want to solidify what I learned and therefore someone else is learning and hopefully they pick up on that same cycle and it's never ending. And that attitude means also that I'm able to learn from anyone Right. And so this removes the hierarchy and these like, you know, silos of priority from who we should be learning from, recognizing that we can learn from anyone and then recognizing that there's always someone that we can pour that out into. And one of the things within the sales for the culture sub community that I lead up, it's we call it the well. And the whole principle is you can't pour from an empty cup. And so if you're not involved in this learn, teach, learn cycle, at some point you're going to run out. And not only would you burn out, but you also potentially diminish the values that you can bring to people that are around you. And so just really, really trumpeting this learn, teach, learn methodology and thinking through life as if that's what we're doing. And that's partially what we're here to do. I think it's highly impactful for those that are around us. I and mean, it puts us in a position where we are, that is service, right? So if I'm learning to hoard information and, and be like a popsicle, you know, be a, you know, a brain on a stick, then that's, that's really not valuable to anyone. But if, my, if the purpose of my learning is to make sure that I find conduits to pour that into so that I can also then be poured into because I now have space because of what I've released, then it's an entire, it's a, it's a paradigm that, that changes the way that you're able to operate and grow. It's really important because, I mean, as you go through this, talking about you're taking a mindset of growth, of giving back, of sharing, of absorbing, of understanding that there's this kind of cyclical nature of, and I really like the idea of the, of the, of the well, you're going to go through periods where you're, the well is going to start to, you're going to give away from the well and it's going to have space to take on more. And then now you've got more to give and right. it's really, really, really good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. It's been really impactful in my own life. That's for sure. So I think one of the other things before we get into the buyer stuff, because I, I, I want to draw the correlation between what we're talking about here and then and you know, the things that our customers struggle with, you know, yeah. the buyers that are out there struggle with. But as we go through, as we go through this, there's, um, you know, there's only so much that I can learn if I continue to learn from those who have the same experiences of me, who have been in ed tech for a number of years and have only been in ed tech. It's amazing what happens if I branch out from ed tech and get into something like you know biotech or get yeah. into something. And I know that's a there's a there's an overlap there because we're talking about tech. Or maybe yeah. I get into manufacturing. Mm -hmm. And the person who I think talks about this really well is the is Tim Ferriss in his idea mm -hmm. of there's more similarities in the top three people in any given industry than there are between the top three people in that industry and the next ten people in that yeah. same industry. Yeah. So yet we get stuck. We tend to get stuck in our own space. We say, look, in order to bring somebody into this organization, they've got to have a background in sales enablement, which is something that's right. started what, uh, you know, it's what, super, young. <laughs> super young. I want to have someone who has 10 years of sales enablement experience. Okay. Yeah. Good yeah. luck. <laughs> so we, we do this stuff when we laugh about it, but we still know that these job descriptions go out there. We say, right. Hey, this is what, this is what we need. But how do we break through and start to say, Hey, there's some value in diversity of experience, diversity of exposure, diversity of whatever in helping to support and drive innovation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's a funny example though, but I mean, you're right on the money. So I'll start with like the thinking around people who are decision makers in these roles and positions, right? And their understanding of what has brought the value to them to make them the leader that they are or the people that they are in these milieus. Like, I love that you brought up Tim Ferriss because way back 2014-ish, actually probably before that, Tim Ferriss's podcast was a must listen for anyone that was on my team. So let's, let's call that 2016-ish. And the reason was because Tim Ferriss interviewed the top of whatever, 
right? You know, he had a, you know, he, he sommeliers, master sommeliers and, you know, Kung Fu champions, the chess grandmaster. And the purpose was for my team, I said, listen, you listen to Tim Ferriss, not only do you hear great question, the great questioning technique, but you also hear how highly intelligent people and highly uh, skilled people answer the questions, right? And it's just something instructive about that that can be synthesized and applied wherever you are, wherever you stand at any given moment. But that belief that that is the case, like that there are, there are learnings and, and things that can be gleaned from every different pocket of society has to be held by a person who's now in a, in a position to look at the qualifications or the resume or the application of a person who may have experience from these varied backgrounds. But if you're unable to look at that and then make that synthesis yourself, then it's going to be very difficult for you to climb that, climb that mountain, right? That's a bridge too far in some cases. The other thing is just expectation as it is communicated in the JD and in the posting and and understanding that there are experiences that align to the intrinsic things or the the you know the the intangibles that you're looking for for the role. And I always say this because the first time I heard it, I said, "Ooh, that's that's phenomenal. That's exactly what I think you should be aligning your hiring to." When people say aptitude, attitude, and then skill, it's rare that there you know that I've seen in my experience or my experience mentoring others that they've seen in their experience. That those are actually those are actually the priorities when it comes down to actually hiring someone or not even hiring someone, bringing them to a point where they get to an interview. So there's a lot of legwork as you mentor people, I think. And this is where to answer your question, like, how can we actually impact this until that whole process changes on the side, the receiving end of the application or the resume? Until that changes, like we have, a, I think, a responsibility and a, and a good opportunity to help younger folks or people early career or people transitioning career recognize what it looks like to extract the intangibles that are required for success in the role that they're going for, to extract that from their current life experience, work experience, and, you know, int- you know, intellectual pursuits and all of those sorts of things so that they can draw the line themselves between those experiences and understandings and what is expected of them to be successful in the role that they're going for and that they can accurately communicate that to the hiring manager when they get in front of them. So there's a couple places. It needs to be, there needs to be probably some adjustment on the recruiting side. There needs to be some adjustment on the expectation of the hiring managers, uh, hiring leadership. That's true. But at the same time, like we who are in the trenches, who are seeing and helping and serving in the community of sales, we need to be really proactive at helping to extract those key capabilities and intangibles out of the life, the experience, and the story of the people who will be applying. 100%. I'm a firm believer that I can teach anybody who's interested in selling how to sell mm-hmm. better. Yeah. What I can't do is I can't teach you to be excited about right. the market. I can't That's teach right. you to want to learn. All of those things, those are things that and, yeah. and you, you just, you had a lot of time before to figure that stuff out. But if you're interested, if you've got the right attitude, the right initiative, the right passion behind this thing, yeah, sky's the limit. And there are a couple of different people who, you know, Carol Quinn's been on the podcast before uh, she wrote a book, Motivation-Based Interviewing and mm-hmm. fascinating book. Uh, George Randall was on, he talked about talent war. Those are, I'll, we'll include links in the show notes, those yeah, episodes those so awesome. people can go through, go through those. But yeah, you, you cannot teach people to be excited or passionate about things. They either are or they aren't. Yeah. And the thing that you can do as a hiring manager, and the thing, the thing that I do when I'm going through the process of bringing people on board is very deliberate about the types of questions I ask and the mm-hmm. type of engagement that I support in those discussions. And being very, I'm very intentional around giving an opportunity for the person on the other end to ask questions because those questions will indicate to me Yeah. What makes them tick? Not yeah, that they went yeah. through and read a book that said, okay, I need to understand your three key priorities from a uh. strategy perspective. And like, <laughs> come on, like, give me, like, that's cool. That, that's what you right. want to know. But don't take those out of a book on best questions to ask in an interview. Oh, no, don't do demonstrate, it. Demonstrate that you're bringing your best self. Like, yeah. Anyway. So, hey, let's talk yeah. about uh, buyer experience because I think there's a really good tie in here. You know, even yeah. when we go through the recruiting process, we go through the community building process. Ideally, mm-hmm. what we're doing is we're trying to connect people who have an, an interest in solving some kind of a problem, 
Uh, yeah. Maybe on the community side, it's I just want to get better at things. And I know there's a better way. It's just hard for me to find it. Myself, or I want to feel like I'm just not alone. Like that might, yeah. be, might be the problem. I just don't want to be alone. And That's then huge. in some other areas, it might be, hey, you know what? I just need to solve for time or I need to mm-hmm. solve for productivity or a number of different things, knowledge, any of these pieces. Yet for some reason, when we get involved in working with customers, we tend to focus more on our business than mm-hmm. their business. We think of it from our sales process perspective. We think about how we're going to move deals forward rather than putting ourselves in the shoes of the buyer and saying, mm-hmm. how can we enable a buyer to be successful? Mm-hmm. What are some common mistakes that people make around that? Or what are, you, what are your thoughts around just what is buyer? Actually, let me just stop with a, probably an easier one. What does buyer enablement mean to you? Yeah, that's a great question. I think buyer enablement first, you know, first we have to start with like, what is what is the journey that a buyer is taking from, you know, being unaware to being aware, to investigating, to evaluating, to purchasing, right? Like what is, what does that journey look like from your buyer's perspective? And then how do you in your quote unquote selling process or cycle support the buyer where they are at the point that you find them, wherever you find them. And I think this is a big push for, you know, more recently, and it's, it's growing like social selling, right? Quote unquote, social selling. You know, you have buyers that are starting to become aware that there's a problem, right? And then what do you have that is supporting them where they are, where they are? Like many cases, they're in communities, they're on, they're on LinkedIn, they're on Twitter. Is there something that you have there that can support them there, educate them there, and get them the, the type of information that they need to move into the next stage of their journey? The other side of it is just recognizing like at each stage of this buyer journey, there are specific questions that are being asked by the buyer. How are you addressing those questions and how are you anticipating what those questions are and what is the content material and ways that you've you've established as an organization to address and to meet them? Again, it's really all about like this, you know, I think we come from an era of inside out selling, right? Which is what you're talking about. We, we, We look at our sales process and we say, let's go and find people to put them into this process. Whereas today, partly driven by the B2C motions, that's no longer sufficient, right? Not, not only is it not sufficient, it's not actually in service to the, to the buyer themselves. So instead, we turn that lens outside in. Like, what does the buyer need to solve the problems that they have or to discover like, that there are solutions to the problem that they have or to shed light on a problem that is prevalent within their industry or community that they may not have been aware of? And so there needs to be sort of this longitudinal perspective and look at who the buyer is, what steps they take in terms of you know, their road to purchase, and then how can we serve them along the way? And a lot of that, again, is coming through you know, social at this point and other ways, right? So there's email, a lot of the things that marketing used to take on the, unto themselves, right? Which is like email nurture campaigns and social media and website stuff and All of those things that used to be uh, held up through the marketing lens is now spreading to be a necessity of sellers, marketers, customer success, and the entire organization, because the goal is to serve buyers wherever they may be at the moment that they're looking for that help or seeking that help. I don't know how clear that was or helpful, but... Yeah, uh, uh, clear. And uh, you covered a lot of ground. And Mm -hmm. there are a couple of couple of images that I've used in the past to talk about a number of these challenges that happened in there. And I'm going to, I'm going to test a couple of them with you just as we go through. One of them, for those of you who like American football, and as a Jets fan, I should not like American football. You should not. I uh, (laughs) wasn't for punishment. I'm, I'm resilient. I am resilient. And uh, uh, they've helped me build up a level of resiliency. There's, you know, if you've ever looked at a football field, you notice that on one side of the 50 yard line, the numbers you know, count toward the left. And then on the other side of the 50 yard line, they count toward the right, depending, or they go up or down, depending on what your perspective of the field is. But there's this journey that the offense is taking on one side of the field while the defense is pushing things back. And they might be at the 10 yard line, the 20 yard line, the 30 yard line, the 40 yard line, the 50 mm-hmm. yard line. And then they get over the hump and start going down the 40, the 30, the 20, and the 10. And I think this is a pretty good metaphor for the challenges that buyers run into when they're going and making decisions. Mm -hmm. There are things that are going to happen where they're going to be able to navigate a portion of that field on their own. Mm -hmm. 
And then they're going to run into some, they're going to run into some defense and that defense is either going to push them back. That defense could either be the junk that we put in front of them as sales professionals because we confuse them with bad Mm -hmm. stuff, or it could be an internal discussion that they have inside the organization where they just say, Hey, this is just not the priority right now. So they, they pause, but either way, they're going to run into some things at different phases that are going to either push them back or accelerate them forward. And one of the ways you can accelerate them forward is by creating an experience that aligns with whatever play it is that they're running. That's right. Everybody out there is a football fan, but you work like just watch a football game. You'll see this happen or go play yeah. techno ball. Actually, techno yeah. ball is play and they're getting, that. and they're getting today. They're getting farther and farther down the field without you than they were 10 years ago. 100%. <laughs> right. And there's then different strategy that the buyer uses on their side of the 50 versus on your side of the 50 is they're making, as they've already made a decision mentally that this is what they want to implement. And then something else that they do once they get in the red zone, that last 20 yards, and even more so the last five yards. That's right. How do you design Mm -hmm. to go through there to say, I know based on what I know about my buyers and what I know about the customers we work with, that these Mm -hmm. are the challenges that they tend to run into at each of these phases. And then how Mm -hmm. can we ask better questions to evaluate whether or not someone is assessed, whether or not someone is actually at one of those phases or the other. And it's mm-hmm. amazing when you ask you know, just this simple question, when you've purchased something like this before, how have you done so? Right. <laughs> and there are some people who have no idea how to answer that question. And if that That's happens right. to be the person you're working with and the only person you're working with inside the organization, you need a little bit of help. Go That's ask right. and find yeah. out who <laughs> inside the organization knows that. And ideally you've built up such a relationship with that person that they want to help. They want to lean on you to help navigate the organization. And you can ask as an external person, you can ask some questions that they might not be able to ask internally because they don't want to embarrass themselves because they don't know or That's right. any number of things. So what do you, what do you think of the football field metaphor? I love it. Um, because yeah, I think, it, yeah, I think it's, I think it's right on point. And it goes, it speaks exactly to what we're, what we're saying, right? Which is that at some point, as soon as the snap happened, they needed help, right? They were reaching out to us. They, you know, sales had the power because sales had the information and sales had the insight, but we're not purveyors uh, or gatekeepers to the information that's available in micro communities on social media, you know, on websites, through community conversations with friends and colleagues, right? There's so much information that's out there that by the time they progress to your side of the field, either you supported and served them along the way or you didn't. And now you're going to tell a disjointed story, right? You're going to, you're going to pick up where they're not at, right? <laughs> you're going to have a conversation that doesn't match where they are. You're going to misinterpret on the basis of some faulty knowledge or information or insight, whereas you could have been with them all along the way. Now, if you remember the first sales success summit, I don't know if you heard my talk day one, where I said, you know, we typically, and I, I, at that time, I thought that, you know, client versus prospect was a false dichotomy. And the reason I said that is because I said, if you define client as a person that you are currently serving with your solution, and you define prospect as a person that you want to serve in the future, but you need to get a conversation with them first, you need to bring them into the fold of your organization second, and now all of a sudden they're a client, so now you can serve them. I said, that's the false dichotomy because those that you want to have a conversation with, those that you want to serve in the future, what prevents you from serving them today? And I said, how would you go about serving someone who's not yet a quote unquote client? And people all over the audience was said through providing helpful content as they're thinking through things to providing thought leadership that helps them shape strategy and thought process. And I was like, exactly. How could you provide that to them? And the answers went up again. Like we would provide that through connecting with them, finding them in groups on LinkedIn, and then just serving them from there. This is not unlike what we're talking about, but you can do that at an organizational level and it can be operationalized in a way that's effective for you as an organization and empowering to your buyer. You mean the responses from the room of successful salespeople wasn't, I'll send them a LinkedIn request and see if they can (laughs) spare 15 minutes so I can pick their brain about the problems they're running into. No, no, no. Yeah, that's the thing. And what's crazy, right, is that the other, like maybe a week ago, maybe a week and a half ago, and I won't name him or the organization, but like one of the biggest organizations in the world, tech company, one of their global VPs of marketing put on LinkedIn and said, 
if you are reaching out to me to get a cold call, to get a meeting with me, if you're reaching out to me cold to get a meeting with me and I look at your LinkedIn page and I don't see anything that in, that gives me insight into the industry, our business, our problems, your solution, I will not take that meeting. What does that mean? Right. What does it mean now for the seller that when you reach out for a meeting with someone that you believe you can help or serve, that the first place they're going is to your LinkedIn profile? What are you doing out there? What are you posting? What are you saying? What do you have a perspective on? What do you have a position on? What do you have an opinion on? If that's not there, you're having now SVPs of global marketing and sales saying, I won't even take a meeting with you on that basis alone. I think it's awesome. And I'm going to go one step further. If you're just taking the stuff that your organization is putting together to give everybody else to put out there and you're all putting the same stuff out there, yeah. you're not doing your job. No. <laughs> like, no. You're no. just have an opinion. Like your insight, if we talked about it a little bit earlier, we talked about attitude, initiative, passion. If you're passionate about the space that you're in, demonstrate that you're passionate about the space that you're in. Comment. Yes, yes, I, you know, yes. I you know, I've taken on a different role and I've been off LinkedIn. I've just been, I've not done anything really there, you know, other than every once in a while I'll share some things or I'll like some stuff, but I'm kind of on a LinkedIn hiatus while I take care of some of the stuff I've, I've got to get done. But yeah. don't just go out there and parrot the same stuff because it's just like if everybody inside your organization is using the same email sequences when they send it to three different people inside an organization, <laughs> do you think those people actually uh, or don't share those? You don't think they talk in, internally? They're like, Ugh. hey, I got the same message from this person. And it looks like they said the Ugh. same thing. We must be inside their sequence. Let's see how it plays out and where it goes next. Like, yeah, be personal, be personal. Yeah. Take, the, take yeah. the time and be personal. Yeah. And then there are rules to engagement. Like we, I mean, you know, we, we, we practice, I practice like the 80, 20 rule, like 80% of the stuff is third party or myself and 20% is about my company. But, but ultimately it's about the things that I'm passionate about. And I'm passionate to work in this space. You know, I'm thankful that we have a tool called live social that makes that really, really drop that easy to, to accomplish. It's the same tool that SAP is using globally as well. They talked a lot about that at our shift conference last week, but it matters and it matters more. And it's going to, increasingly matter more as the field gets longer on the side of the buyer, right? Because they're looking for the service. They're looking for the, the information. They're looking for the insight at different levels and different points of their, of their journey. And we need to be where those revenue moments are happening. Yeah. The foundational skills when it comes to sales haven't changed. I right. believe. I believe they're the, they're the same. What has changed are the tools that you mm -hmm. can use to help improve what you're doing. Mm-hmm. And what also has changed is the amount of information that people have access to. Yeah, now, the amount of information nuts. that people have access to creates more risk. Like we were just talking before about the amount of noise that's out there in the market. Yeah. There's a lot of noise. Every, yeah. every, you know, you're out there with you know, whatever the product is that you sell out there or mm -hmm. the product is that you want to deliver out to the market. There's somebody else who's doing, solving for the same problem in, that's right. in, a, different, in a different way they're likely trying to do the same thing, which means they're just continuing to put more and more information out there. How do you differentiate? In my mind, the way you differentiate is in the questions you ask. Yeah, the, yeah. The, and then the question, not only the questions you ask the first question, but then the mm -hmm. question you ask the on the next one, because you're demonstrating that you've actually listened to right. the person, <laughs> not just sat there around and be like, okay, well, now I've got my 20 questions to business fit. Let me just roll through these things and see if we can qualify you into a deal. Like, yeah. Uh, how, what CRM do you use? We don't use a CRM. Okay. How you like Salesforce? <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. What don't you like about Salesforce? I don't, right. We don't use a CRM. Yeah. Uh, you don't use a CRM? Oh, I must've missed uh, that. Yeah. yeah. And we Absolutely all, we're awesome. all getting, we're all getting better at, I think over time, and this is learn, teach, learn, right? I have conversations. I've asked questions that fall flat and don't, you know, elicit the response that I anticipated. I need to learn that. Right. And so this learn, teach, learn is applicable all over the place. Uh, and, and in terms of questioning, it, it throws me back. Like we were talking about interviewing and the questions you ask in an interview. Like one of my favorite questions to ask someone in an interview, uh, for, specifically for sales when I was hiring, was, hey, you have three minutes right now. Anything in the entire universe that you are passionate about, explain it to me so that I then understand it. Anything. And so 
my goodness, if you can't go into your mind and figure out something that in your life you're passionate about, now you have an opportunity to bring me on board with that passion, then to me, that's that's one of those things where I'm just like, okay, well, how then do you develop a passion around the solution that we're trying to sell and then express it if you can't express the passion that you have about your 13-year-old puppy that you had since you were two, right? If that doesn't come across in that conversation, like I'm, I have a couple questions. That is absolutely awesome. I'm going to steal that question because the one that I want, I, I don't give them a time frame. And usually what I do is I just say, it's a, what gets you excited? What are you, yeah. what are you excited about doing? And then, or I'll ask the question, when you've got time to just kind of break away from things, what do you do? Where do you spend that extra time to find the peace or that energy, whatever it is? And there, it depends on role and, yeah, yeah. and kind of how the rest of the conversation's gone through. And if the response is, I get really excited to prospect. Then I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so you prospect in your spare time. Like that's what you do? Like with or without a job? <laughs> <laughs> They're like, okay, why? <laughs> well, you know, and then you just kind of, yeah. So it just, it's a, I think one of the things we can do is we can get better at asking simple questions when working with our customers. We cannot overcomplicate the situation. Not yeah. try to be smarter than we are or whatever it is. Yeah. Not try to push yeah. on this impression that we've got all the information. Remember, the people you're talking to are the ones who are actually doing the work. Right. Ask them, what are they struggling with? How are they doing with it? And do, doing the work. And then if you're, you're going to get into one of those situations where you want to kind of under, demonstrate a level of understanding, then you go through and you say, you know, common, you know, one of the common challenges we see in this market is mm-hmm. this. How have you solved for that? And yeah. you might be shocked at the number of people who come back and say, as a huge challenge and we're still trying to figure it out. We've not figured it out. But now yeah. you're actually having a real discussion around That's things right. that impact their business, not stuff that you're looking to pitch. Like Unless you just happen to be one of those people who happens to work in such a transactional environment. And I'm thinking like the Chuck Box in Tempe where they only take cash and you <laughs> choose, your, your choice is a half pound burger uh, or third pound burger, a half pound burger, a double half pound burger, or some chicken, fries and onion rings. Right. You're, 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 you're not going to ask about protein. Gonna what's, your, what's your normal protein intake? Yeah. I want to help guide you to the right sandwich. <laughs> it's exactly right. What would you like? Right. <laughs> That's it. Uh, yeah. What can I get for you? All right. So we've covered a lot of range. There's I think a way that we can tie this all back all together is mm-hmm. how can we, you've had an opportunity to go be both in individual contributor roles and leadership mm-hmm. roles and yeah. You lead in community, like you've had an opportunity to lead people and you've taken advantage of that opportunity. You've leaned into that opportunity to, to give yeah. back. How can we as leaders help those who are out there who are struggling with this kind of stuff because they just happen to have the pressure of the number for the week, the number for yeah. the month, the number for the quarter. And there's just this hard push that they're getting inside the organization where Someone reads what somebody else said about something else. And now all of a sudden they want to shift what's going on inside the business. What can we do as leaders to help people get through a lot of the challenges that we're talking about, which is, you know, we talked about community and we talked about understanding buyers and we talked about asking questions and Mm -hmm. helping people through how can we lead better in this space? Yeah. You know, what comes to mind immediately as as almost an umbrella to all of it is just creating environments where there's psychological safety. You know, I talk a lot about within the communities and unflinching friends. And, you know, for those who have heard me talk about that ad nauseum on podcast after podcast, platform after platform, like you're listening to me have a conversation right now with one of my unflinching friends, Mike Simmons. And you, you need to be able to, to create an environment, whether that's for your buyer, whether that's for someone who reports to you, whether that's for a colleague, whether that's for someone who's an executive in your organization, there needs to be an environment of psychological safety because the admission that I'm struggling in this area or I'm suffering in this area or there's a gap in this area, that admission is hidden behind the bush that is psychological safety, right? So if, you remember, if, if psychological safety doesn't exist, then you're not going to hear about the, the ways that you can actually help and serve, right? You hear about opportunities to help and serve when you've created an environment within these relationships where there's freedom, flexibility, psychological safety, and an unflinching you know, response to the things that are brought up. And so, you know, as leaders in whatever sphere we lead in, I think a top priority is making sure that the environment in which we lead is a safe environment for people to have ideas that are dissenting, for people to disagree uh, appropriately and respectfully, and for people to speak up 
often and frequently. And if we do that, then I think a lot of the barriers that we're finding ourselves facing will suddenly come down. Duan, I do not know a better way to end the podcast than on that note. Where can people find out more about what you're what you're doing, what you're working on? Where, where do you want to send people? Yeah, um, LinkedIn, Dewan Brown on LinkedIn. I'm Stratus now on Twitter. And please do uh, check out salesfortheculture.com. All right, we'll add links to the show notes. If you know of someone who would get value out of this podcast, and there are a lot of people I think that would get value out of this episode, we've covered a lot of stuff. Please share it with them. Let us know via LinkedIn, Twitter, tag Dewan and I in that. Thank you for listening to the Catalyst Sale Podcast. Sales is a thinking process. How are you thinking differently about yours? Mm-hmm.